the Churches Conservation Trust is the national charity for churches at risk. We look after 360 churches vested in us by the Church of England and when they come to us often they've been neglected or have some form of damage to them and we repair them. Church buildings tend to be the centre of a village or a town or a community. They tell the history of the local community, so it's really important that we keep these buildings standing and maintained really well so that people can enjoy them now and in the future. So an annual maintenance visit, we have two that happen every year. Each church in our estate is visited by our maintenance contractors. We do annual maintenance visits whereby we will check the gutters, clear the gullies, maintain what they call the cordon sanitaire, which is the metre band around the footprint of the church. We'll check the slates, clean the gutters high level, so all the lead work, replace where we can any of the slates that are broken, report back any defects to the office, anything that is going to be detrimental to the welfare of the building can be highlighted. It's really important to maintenance because the main thing is to make sure that our churches are happy and healthy. The main thing is to keep water out of the buildings and so looking after the rainwater goes looking after the drainage. Although it's not that glamorous, it's really, really important because when things go wrong, they can go dramatically wrong and letting water into the building is something that we don't want. As with all the churches that we look after, there are varying degrees of work needing to be done, some more serious than others. We try and do what we can, where we can, but it's never a simple case of being able to walk away and then being good for the next five years. The next maintenance visit will always show something else that needs attention. We practice a stitching time maintenance. This means that if we just replace a slip slate as soon as possible, the water doesn't pour through the fabric and rot the roof structure. So this will save us costs and it will also mean that more of the ancient fabric is able to be saved. The CCT is just here trying to save these buildings. We rely on the generosity of the communities through both time and donations and their support can help these buildings continue for generations to come. Thing, the church didn't look like this and whenever I come in actually it makes me smile because it is now so beautiful and bright and where there was damp it's all gone it's been eradicated where there were bits of plaster about to fall off the walls I don't stand at the front in fear that something will fall off on someone's head any longer everything just sings really to the beauty of the church so it's quite changed Churches are vested in the CCT, where they have been closed for regular public worship by the Church of England, but are of such a quality, architecturally, historically, or archaeologically, that um, they are, if you like, too good for a new use to be introduced in, into them. The criteria in the legislation is that, is that they are of such importance to the nation and the Church of England that they should be preserved um, by, by the CCT. Church in the Field was vested in the CCT, I think, for three main reasons. Firstly, its historic significance. It was built um, in roughly 1668, which was a period when the building of churches in England was rare. We'd come through the Commonwealth period and the restoration of the monarchy had just taken place. And uh, in that period, immediately beforehand, uh, there hadn't been many churches built. Um, secondly, described um, by Pevsner, as one of the most instructive cases of early Gothicism in England, 
Uh, so architecturally it's significant as a fine but small scale version of a perpendicular Gothic church. And, and as such, thirdly, it has a fine set of late, late 17th century furnishings um, in, in the Laudian tradition. So I've been working with Adrian Browning for the last year. We've been liaising about the different issues for this church. So um, looking at the parish, uh, looking at their capacity, um, how much they love the church, but mainly looking at the repair, because I'm here to find out what the costs and, how, and the different repairs that we might need to do to this church. My role in the, in the vesting of, of the church in the field has been to oversee the work from inception to completion really so starting with inspections of the various aspects of the building and um, understanding its nature its materials and its its repair needs and um, to specify what needs to be done um, and then to uh, oversee the commissioning of specialist contractors and subcontractors to make sure the repair works undertaken in the right way really important to work with specialists like Simon Boyd. Um, we couldn't not, we just couldn't achieve a, a really high quality repair without having um, a clock maker, without having a stonemason, without having a, a specialist glazier, you know, all of these, these skills. Um, I mean, Somerset and Devon and Dorset uh, just have the most fantastic craftspeople in them. And uh, in order to do the best for the church, we have to use these traditional craft skills that we used to build the church 500 years ago. During the vesting process, a lot of local people did actually express much more of an interest in the church and particularly when the work was going on, the physical work on the building. I do think the Church's Conservation Trust has done an absolutely splendid job here. You only have to look around to see how much has been achieved. I think the Church Conservation Trust has done an amazing job. Uh, I said we are very privileged that they took this on, so we did, we did appreciate there was a lot of other churches that needed needed help as well as we did. Um, the church you know, may have had to have been closed if we couldn't have had the CCT, simply because it's on private land and therefore makes it more difficult um, for general public to visit if it's not a safe building and it's now being made safe and being made a place where people feel very comfortable. Well, hello everyone and welcome to yet another Thursday lunchtime lecture here from the Church's Conservation Trust. It really is wonderful um, that you're all able to join us today. Um, a warm welcome, especially to those of you who are joining us for the first time, an even warmer welcome to those who are coming back. Um, again, it's really great to have you here. I see we've got people watching from St. Lucia, from the United States, right across um, England, Scotland and Wales and Ireland. So again, a warm wel welcome and thank you for joining. So today we're going to be exploring um, a rather macabre subject, um, which is body snatchers, and we're really grateful to Susie Lennox for giving up her time to do this lecture for us today. Now, before we go in, I'm just going to, as usual, just explain how this lecture is going to work um, for those of you who are um, joining us the first time. So firstly, please remember these lectures are completely free of charge. We never um, charge you to watch them. We don't put any paywalls in place for you to access the live stream. 
So if you ever see anyone commenting, telling you what you might be doing elsewhere, please do not click those links. Um, we never charge. Um, if you've got any questions or unsure about anything being posted, just send us a direct message and we can check that out for you. Now, the easiest way for you to get a notification from Facebook when we go live, um, and it's a really easy way to join these lectures, is to just make sure that you like and follow our Facebook um, page. We've put a link in the description um, of this video, and there's a video on our homepage on Facebook explaining how you can join these lectures really easily. But as I said, if you've got any problems, just send us a direct message or comment below and we'll be on hand to help you. Now, one of the best things about these lectures is that at the, time, at the end of this lecture, there'll be plenty of time for you to ask Susie your questions. So please do, um, throughout the lecture, comment away. Um, now, if you like these lectures, please make sure you like them. Do share them with your friends and family because we'd like to see more people come to these lectures. Um, but please do consider making a donation to help us care for our 356 churches. Um, Peter's going to talk to you shortly um, about some of the great news we've had recently, but also some of the challenges we're facing. So your donations really are enormously grateful and will help us in caring for these wonderful um, buildings on behalf of the nation. Now, we've got a special membership offer running at the moment where if you join us by direct debit from £3 a month, um, we'll be sending you a free copy of Matthew Burns' Beautiful Churches book. Now, there's details of that on our homepage. But again, if you've got any questions about wanting to become a member, want to know any of the benefits, just send us a message and we can give you direct links. Now, I'm going to pass you over to Peter now, who's going to ex um, tell you a bit about <coughs> us as a charity and what we've been doing over the lockdown. Over to you, Peter. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's been really great watching you all signing in. So I could safely say that all corners of the British Isles are represented today. Uh, we've got a good contingency from America. I saw someone from Malaysia and St. Lucia as well. So uh, very welcome to all of you, whether you're basking in the sunshine or unlike us, or unlike us, or we're all wading through the water in the rain. Um, so I just wanted to briefly tell you a little bit about the, the Church's Conservation Trust and then give you an, uh, an idea of what we're up to at the moment. So uh, we were founded in 1969. We were uh, set up to save historic places of worship, which no longer had a regular congregation. But the buildings were so important to, uh, to the country that they needed looking after. And since then, we've collected 356 of these buildings right across England, and we take on about two or three more every year. Uh, we have really, at the moment, we're looking at what happens because of the COVID pandemic. Will there be more closures of historic churches in the countryside, particularly? That might be an issue. And so how can we best help communities make sure that these buildings uh, survive uh, and that they're used and loved into the future, however that may be? So our income's taken quite a hit over this period because we raised a lot of money uh, through holding events and also through just through people visiting. And just to give you a, a sort of stark number, uh, I was told to be cheerful, so I'm going to be cheerful, <laughs> but here's a stark number for you. Um, just through people not depositing coins in our wall safes, we're £78,000 down this year. Uh, and that's quite a significant hit for us. Uh, this is really important money to support us. On the other hand, the good news is that there has been lots of money been put aside by the government very generously to support the cultural and heritage sector. And we were successful in getting 1.6 million pounds from the Heritage Stimulus Fund, which was provided by Historic England and the government. The issue for us, of course, is that we have to contribute £300,000 worth of the money towards this grant. So we're busy raising that money to make sure that this money can go into repairing our buildings. But more importantly, what it's doing is it's helping support those specialist contractors who deal with historic building repairs. And we're really pleased to do this. Unfortunately, that cash doesn't prop up the, the hole that we got in our income, which is about half a million pounds this year. So every donation is really, really welcome. So please do consider donating, which George explains to you and also do take advantage of our wonderful membership offer uh, where you get hold of a free copy of this fantastic book of our churches as well as three copies of our fantastic pinnacle magazine every year we rely on support from people uh, like you and it's really really important to us and very much appreciated today is also a great day because we've announced a new trustee joining us uh, reverend tim good has just been confirmed by the queen and it was announced by number 10 this morning and also uh, the reappointment of two of our um 
our two our trustees have been fantastic, Sue Wilkinson and Will Donaldson as well. So I'm a very happy chief executive because I know we've got a good solid board there uh, looking after all of our interests, which is great. So before I go on, uh, I should really it's, it's time to, for me to shut up and introduce Susie, who I'm really grateful for giving up her time to come and talk to us today. Um, so Susie Lennox studied history at Teesside and completed her master's degree in archive administration in 2011. And she left that sector in 2015, but she's been researching all aspects, as you would, of body snatching for over 15 years. Uh, and she wrote about the legal implications of the trade for her dissertation at university. And she has a book, which is called Body Snatchers Digging Up the the Untold Story of Britain's Resurrection Men, which is published by Pen and Sword in 2016, which I'm sure you can find a link to and buy. And she's just returned to university to focus on a new career in crime scene science. And she's got a great website, which I was looking at this morning, so you don't get burked. But when you have a look at the website, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And I'm sure a link can be shared for that as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. Unfortunately, I'm going to miss the end of the lecture because I've got to go to another meeting, which is I'm a bit gutted about. But of course, I can watch it on YouTube afterwards, which is great. So without further ado, over to you, Susie, and thanks so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And George, I'll just um, attempt here to share my screen. Let me see. Um, that should, should work. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up there from George, so all good. Um, so as I say, thank you, George and the Church's Conservation Trust, just for inviting me along uh, this afternoon uh, to talk to you about my absolute passion, which is uh, body snatching. Um, I don't know how it started. Well, I do, but that's another story. Um, but I hope that you'll enjoy it uh, this afternoon too. So for this afternoon, I want to take you on a tour of perhaps some of Britain's finest body snatching sites. We'll be looking at examples mainly from Scotland today, not just because this is where most body uh, snatching prevention relics have survived, but also because this is where most prevention devices were installed in the first place. We'll be dipping our toes into England just a little, but for the most part, we'll be focusing on sites that help to supply the steady, steam, st steady stream of cadavers to the anatomy schools of Edinburgh, Glasgow, and more predominantly Aberdeen. We're going to be looking um, at mort houses in the Highlands, caged lairs in Glasgow, and mort stones in Aberdeenshire, and you're going to be listening to just a few body snatching tales along the way. Now I know we have a global audience. I think I think I heard Peter say Malaysia or something, so that's great. So just to um, to put everything into perspective, really, before we start off on our travels, I want you to show you a very simple map of where we're going to go. So you can just get your bearings a bit for later. The areas that we're focusing on today are all near the proximity of medical schools. So Aberdeen on the east coast and then moving west are the anatomy schools of Glasgow. And then finally, we have Edinburgh. We're looking predominantly around the Aberdeenshire area this afternoon, mainly because there are some excellent examples of preventative measures that have survived here. And also, uh, I'm not discounting a few choice, uh, choice sites as you can see, as we're traveling around. Hope you have a pen and paper ready with you. I will be giving the names of some churches and they're also on the bottom of the slides as well. So if you find anywhere that you want to, to visit in particular, you know where they are. If, if you miss anything, do please get in touch with, with Church's Conservation Trust and I will, of course, share where these relics are. Now we're going to start off this afternoon with just a very, very brief overview of why body snatching happened in the first place. What actually caused this drive in the demand for cadavers? Just to help to put body snatching into a little bit of context. The number of legally available cadavers um, available to the teaching schools and the hospitals of England and Scotland in the late 17th century simply wasn't meeting demand. Uh, student numbers were steadily rising and teaching styles were changing. Anatomy lectures had traditionally been taught using wet or dry specimens in jars, by using wax anatomical models, or by having a cadaver placed centrally on a dissecting table with a demonstrator pointing out the key parts of the human body, while the surgeon dictated from his notes. By the turn of the century, a new style of teaching was emerging, one which was promising students a cadaver of their own, uh, to work on rather than having to rely on the body parts that had been kept in brine and which had probably been reused by countless numbers of students beforehand. 
There's only one flaw with this, the number of legally available cadavers. Even after the 1752 Murder Act had added dissection as part of the punishment to those convicted of murder, numbers of cadavers fell extremely short of the number actually needed by the anatomy schools. In the early days of body snatching, the students and anatomists were the body snatchers themselves. But as demand grew higher and the risks of getting caught increased, this work would eventually have been passed into the hands of the professional resurrection men. But what exactly was body snatching? Body snatching was the digging up of freshly buried bodies in the middle of the night and selling them to the surgeons so that they could in turn teach their students human anatomy and also to develop their own knowledge and understanding of the craft. It's a lucrative trade. By the turn of the century, large sums of money were often changing hands. Things, as the body snatchers called them, um, by about 1790 could fetch two guineas and a crown for an adult and children saw for about six shillings a foot. That's the equivalent of say about 180 pounds today for an adult and a child about 23 pounds per foot. As demand grew and the century wore on, an adult corpse by around 1810 could earn a body snatcher around four pounds at four shillings. It's about 200 pounds in today's money, while a child's corpse was priced by the inch. By the time Burke and Hare were on the scene and Burke was hung in 1829, cadavers were fetching between seven and 10 pounds. So around 470 to 680 pounds in today's money, sometimes maybe even more. And there was certainly money to be made from body snatching. Now, as churchyards were being targeted on a more regular basis, so the need to protect your loved ones grew. Now, what follows is our ancestors' answer to fending off the body snatchers and the preventative measures put into place to try and ensure that our loved ones remained buried. Now, many of you may already have seen a watch house before and not quite realised what it is. More often than not, they are the small stone buildings at the back of the churchyard and along a side wall. They probably have a window or two, maybe it's even a chimney, like this one here in Advey in the Highlands. And more often than not, they're being used to store garden equipment or tools for the churchyard. They mainly date from around 1820, 1830, and watch houses and watch towers are one of the more prolific forms of body snatching prevention that we can find in our graveyards today. Their survival has been dependent on their reuse. Nearly every watch house that we see um, keeps their, uh, that keeps their door open is now used as some form of storage for gardening tools, signs for open days and so forth. On a few occasions, I've seen storage of art artificial funeral flowers, so their use is, is really endless. Cromdale here in the Highlands is a very typical example. And you can notice that it's also um, nearly identical to Advi if we take another look at that. Although Adby um, has the corrugated roof on, so it's a new tin roof there, where this um, example in Cromdale still has the slate, even though they've probably been repaired and replaced. There are some exceptions though, as to the use um, of, the, of the watch house, such as this one in Tundergarth and Dumfries and Galloway. And this is a memorial to the Lockerbie disaster. They've also been adapted to be used as Sunday schools, like the Watch House, um, and do uh, pardon my pronunciation on some of these Scottish places, in, in doors near Bol Bolskine or Bolskin in the Highlands. And the Watch House in Eymouth in um, Berkshire um, is used as a community space, I understand, although I do get the impression that it is under threat of closure at the moment. Now, watch houses and towers came in a variety of different sizes and designs. From the tower-like structures that those that can be seen at Eckford on the left there in the borders, and the near identical watchtower at Dalkeith in Midlothian. Now, Eckford was the site of a very wild body snatching tale dating from 1829. One evening, James Goodfellow, otherwise known as Dandy Jim, was walking home past the churchyard after visiting his sweetheart. As he passed by, he noticed a strange light disappearing and then reappearing near a grave. It didn't take him long to realise that he'd stumbled on a pair of body snatchers and he decided to hatch a plan to take care of them once and for all. The body snatchers had left their horse and gig tied to a nearby tree and Dandy Jim casually untied the horse and sent it galloping across the nearby fields. When the body snatchers were off chasing their getaway vehicle, Dandy Jim swapped places with the cadaver and the pair, had, the pair had just dug up out of the ground. 
When the body snatchers eventually returned, they threw their tools and the cadaver into the back of the cart and headed backwards for home. It was an unsettling journey. Fearful of being caught, the body snatchers were getting more and more agitated as the miles slipped by, with one of them declaring that the body in the back was still warm. Unable to control himself any longer, Jim threw back the covers, surprising the life out of the two snatchers who jumped from the gig and fled across the open fields. Now it is said that from this body snatching attempt, the parishioners of Eckford rallied together to collect funds for the watch house that you see in the parish church grounds today. Now, larger watchtowers can be found in New Carlton in Edinburgh and also at St Cuthbert's on the right there. And by 1803, there was a regular wash, watch based at St Cuthbert's. As uh, the years wore on, it proved rather successful at spotting body snatchers. In 1827, three men were um, seen escaping over the churchyard walls, which incidentally had been heightened to eight foot in 1738 due to the level of body snatching um, that was carrying on in the churchyard. So trying to escape over the walls would have been no easy feat. But escape they did, although it is said that as they climbed over the walls, they left behind them their tools as well as traces of blood. Now the only surviving watchtower in England is this beautiful example at High Bradfield in South Yorkshire, or Derbyshire, it depends on where you stand on the boundary. Now the watch tower at High Bradfield was built in 1745, but it's of little use to the parishioners when in February 1830, Joseph Hall was stand, found standing in the grave of a Joseph Fox. He was actually caught when three local men were walking home near the churchyard and they happened to spot his gig parked up alongside the wall. Hall was apprehended only 60 yards from the grave itself after trying to make his escape and would, would later be sentenced to three months imprisonment. We also find octagonal and hexagonal watch houses, which add a little bit more of a character to what is usually just a square box. Examples can be found in Cooper Angus, um, in Perth and Kinross on the left hand side there, and in Ed and Killy in the Highlands. We can see that the windows of both the watch houses would have had a clear view across the churchyard in their day. Cooper Angus even now has a very clear view across the fields as you can see from the picture there, whereas in uh, Edin Killy, if we take a closer look, we can see that it's actually been built into the churchyard walls and the windows on the other side now face into a private garden. These naturally have been bricked up in, in Edin Killy to maintain privacy, but as we shall see in a moment when we take a look inside, the view across the churchyard and the surrounding area would still have been clear. Now I did have a video here and unfortunately it didn't play very well uh, earlier this morning so I've had to swap it. Um, we're going to try and get a copy to George but we've got uh, some pictures instead and I hope you can see from these just an example of what the watch house inside would have been like. It's rather rud rudimentary. Um, this is uh, Edin Killy and there's very little that went into the way of comfort for the men who happened to be on watch for the night. Now hopefully you can get a feeling for the space inside, quite small and very basic, but it would have afforded an ample view across the graveyard. And you can see that some did have fireplaces. You can, I'll just get a pointer up actually and we can have a look. Uh, there's a fireplace just there. And this, um, I pres it's too, it's too um, big to be a window. I expect it to be a door but it's in the wrong place for a door. Uh, so maybe it's just a big window, but you can see in here as well, there's a bricked up window. And then this window just here actually looks over the graveyard. Now you can see, and say so some did have fireplaces and this is quite common in the watch houses that you'll see if you ever go inside one. This is Rafford Watch House along the similar lines um, to uh, Ed and Killy there. And it's a typical design of what you'll see. A brief look inside, again, you can see a small fireplace and a boarded up um, brick um, window. It's very tatty inside this one. Um, it had been used for storage and also a, a bit of a rubble ground. But, you know, it still gives you a bit, a bit of impression of what's going on in there. Now, despite this, this lack of design, I think that they could have been quite cosy affairs once the fire was on and the whiskey was flowing. And in fact, there are a number of watch houses where the rules for the watch have survived. And some of these rules are quite specific, even stating that the watch, watch should not drink. 
presumably the fear of falling asleep and missing all the action, um, but you, you don't know. Now, these are pretty typical, as I said, for what you find for watch houses in Scotland. Other examples can be found in St. Cyrus in Aberdeenshire, Doddington in Northumberland, and Dalgetty Bay in Fife. Watch houses also built in England, and London boasts a number of examples. We have Bermondsey on the left, which is a coffee shop, and Bethnal Green, which was built in 1754. Both of these are of particular note. You may not know that they're um, watch houses at first glance because there's no graveyard immediately obvious there. The watch houses are watch huts at St. Thomas A. Beckett in Warblington in Hampshire, dating from about 1828, are also often mentioned in relation to England and to body snatching. These are the watch houses here and they are built diagonally opposite. So one in the northeast corner and one in the southwest corner. And these images here, I um, I hope it's okay. I took them from the HampshireHistory.com website. Uh, I've riffs referenced at the bottom there. Now let's have a quick look at mort stones. You could easily walk past these uh, in some churchyards and be forgiven for thinking that it was just a lump of rock. But the mort stones, thankfully, are a little bit more obvious. Mort stones were seen as another form of simple prevention, something that was probably already available and easily reused. The mort stone here on the left is from Inverurie, um, again in Aberdeenshire, and it's thought to be two separate stones, one adult and one child. Um, and the mort stone is, a very, is an extremely simple idea. A large lump of rock uh, placed over the coffin after burial would have remained in situ for a period of about six weeks and then been renew, uh, removed and reused. The example here, and we'll just go back, the one at Peter Cooter, I'll just uh, highlight it, you can just see it. I did walk over this a few times, to be honest with you. Um, I was looking for something a little bit more often like shape, but I didn't get it. Um, so you can you can walk past them if you if you um, don't know what you're looking for. And these are just rough shapes uh, in the ground. A site at Peter Kuta, incidentally, is on the banks of the River Dee. So the picture on the right hand side um, is the view from the uh, from the churchyard, looking down um, into the churchyard extension there. And it is said that 50 years after the passing of the Anatomy Act, so that's in 1882, a group of medical students who wanted to mark the anniversary of the Act rode up the D from the University in Aberdeen and entered the churchyard and stole a cadaver. On a recent visit, this visit here to Peter Cooter, I went to stand at the edge of the churchyard um, in where I thought was going to be the most obvious landing spot, uh, the watch house didn't have a clear view. It's actually, if you stand looking at the picture, it's on my, over my right shoulder there. Um, and it wouldn't have had a clear view down, down the river at that time. So the students would probably have got, a, uh, got into the churchyard unchallenged. Plus you've also got to remember at this time in 1882 that the watch probably had stopped meeting by this point and the body snatching, um, and not it, the fear had died down a bit. So it probably comes complete surprise to the parishioners that they'd been targeted in the first place. Now, in contrast to the rough hewn stones that can be found throughout Scotland's churchyards are the mort stones that have a bit more of a definition about them. And this fine example here, even though it is broken under into three over its own weight and with the ground shifting, is the mort stone at Gullen in East Lothian. Casts a bit more of an idea onto its usage. We can see how thick it is there um, and, and solid. You can just see, I'll just get a pointer, you should be able to see those actually, um, how it would have been put into place. Um, we Probably by um, properly iron bars through the handles that are embedded into the top of the stone and men on the end, or probably using what we call mort safe tackle, which we'll see in, in a moment. Now, perhaps the most stunning example of a mort stone to have survived is at Prestwick in Argyll. And it's considered to be one of the finest examples of a mort stone that is still in situ. We can see the hooks for lifting into place. I will just point those out for you. There's one here, there's one here, and there would have been a third one further down, so at the feet end. And there's also an iron strap here. Now that would have secured um, either round the coffin itself, or it would have just been iron, bar, iron bars just straight down into the soil just securing the, the stone in place a little bit more. But this particular mort stone is very solid and it was clearly designed not, not to be moved. Whether or not the inhabitant is still underneath that, we do not know. 
It wasn't long before the resurrection men figured out a way to access cadavers beneath these heavy lumps of rock. And that was to access the coffins at the narrow end, break it open and, and pull the, the body out that way. And so the Mort Safe began to take place. Made by the local blacksmith, Mort Safes first started appearing around Scotland about 1819, 1820, and can cost anything up to five pounds. So about 280 pounds in today's money. We can say for some certainty that mort safes are a Scottish uh, invention, a Scottish device, and a number of different device, uh, designs appeared over the years. Um, mort safes were either iron frames and the two halves or parts uh, would have fitted around the coffin and a series of iron bars like the ones shown here in the mort safe from Bolton in East Lothian. Um, would have fitted the two halves together. There's also the solid iron over coffin, which would have been um, lowered over the wooden coffin like a sheath, which we'll see in a minute, and um, those that survived in Aberfoyl in Stirlingshire. If we look a lot more closely at the framework design or the cages first, this one here is a particularly excellent example um, from Bolton. You can see clearly the rods that would have been used to fasten the two sides of the mort safe together. And there's a bespoke nut and spanners used to hold the rods in place. There are 28 rods in total here. Only two are on display when I, when I visited this. It's a few years ago now, so that may have changed. You can see the holes around the edge of the, the mort safe lid, and they would have been driven through here. The bespoke spanners and nuts adding an extra level of security. Another excellent example of this style of mort safe dates from 1816 and can be found hanging on the walls of the Lich Gate in the Old Kirk in Eyre on the west coast of Scotland. The two halves would have been clamped together around the coffin like a frame and once the threat of body snatches was over, um, it, it, would have been, it would have been removed. A, a terrific example of body snatching prevention, even if it is painted to within an inch of its life, is this one here. And I do uh, particularly like the words mort safe written down the side there, just so you know what it is. Now the mort safes that we see in churchyards are ones um, that are leaning up against the, the wall or if they've been put onto the, to the walls like this one here, they would have been owned by the parish. By the mid 1850s, we start seeing articles in newspapers where parish mort safe societies are being disbanded and the mort safes are being sold off. The threat of body snatching starting to lift from within the community. We also lost a number of body snatching prevention um, relics such as these to the scrap metal drives of World War II. So anything that has survived is, is uh, very rare indeed now. Oh, my mouse is stuck. Oh, there we go. My mouse is stuck for a second there. So if we take a closer look at the more solid iron coffin, the style that slips over the wooden coffin as a sheath, there's a few superb examples um, dotted around Scotland, but my favourite has to be these in Aberfoyle in Stirlingshire, and these are proudly displayed um, either side of the entrance to the old church doorway. These, uh, I saw them for the first time last year, and I think they're absolutely, absolutely stunning. You can see just from the thickness of the handles how big and heavy these things were, and they would have been used, been putting, uh, put over the coffin um, with mot safe tackle that we shall see, sh see shortly. Similar examples to these ones here can be found in Curtin uh, and Durris in Aberdeenshire, where the mort safe is said was used, formerly used as a water trough by the local farmer. And there's also one in Bankery Devonick, identical to this one, um, which is alongside the wall near to the watch house. Um, it's a very, very, it's practically a, a replica there is I don't know if you can see the little holes in the bottom there I'll just highlight them little holes there um, and that would have been like an iron bar put over there or even the hooks from the mort safe tackle and lowered over so getting a mort safe into situ wasn't an easy matter one of the major deterrents of the mort safe itself was its sheer weight and they needed special equipment in order to be moved a moving device called a mort safe tackle, um, essentially a tripod was utilized for moving both mort safes and mort stones. There would have been a number of chains that came from a central pivot um, on a tripod, which would have hooked onto the mort safe frames or, handled and, um, or handles and then lowered into position. Now the image here, I discovered quite by chance on the internet quite a few years ago now, and it shows the technique perfectly. 
I apologize for the quality of the image, the only one I've ever been able to find. A friend of mine did have a bit of a hunt and we discovered that it seemed to come from a leaflet in Kent. So if anybody does know its origins, I would be incredibly grateful if you could let me know because I would like to credit whoever drew it. I also want to know where they got their inspiration from because to me, it is exact replica uh, or drawing of this here, which is the Luss Mort Safe in Argyle and Butte. Now, this particular mort safe is a one-off and would have been made uh, for private use. You can see it looks like it's a table tomb um, that has been converted into a mort safe and had an iron skirt put around it. Based on designs that are predominantly in Aberdeenshire, the thick, heavy upper stone and then the iron skirt. The mort safe here at Towie in Aberdeenshire is actually upside down, but it does show you perfectly the way that the iron skirt would have looked on many of these mort safes. Uh, and um, it shows you that it would have been an additional feature and it would have been pushed into the ground, making it even a bit more difficult to remove. This one here has obviously been moved from its original location and slowly, unfortunately, sinking back into the soil. Now, the use of a mort safe would have come through means of a subscription and many parishes had a mort safe society. When in situ, the mort safe often hired out at a shilling a day, which would have been left in place for about six weeks, just long enough for the cadaver to have been of no interest to the surgeons. Now, this is the caged lairs. These are the ultimate in body snatching prevention, and they always bring a smile to my face. I'm not sure why. They showed not only wealth and status, and the caged lair was an impenetrable fortress of iron. Although examples of caged lairs can be found in a number of different churchyards in Scotland, Edinburgh, for example, has this caged lair for the surgeon William Ingalls, uh, who died in 1792. Uh, and we can just make that out in the image there. There's also some in Dunbar in East Lothian, which now has a roofless example, but the best and most stunning caged lairs that have survived. You need to head to Glasgow to really find out where they, what these ones are. Now, these examples here literally are cages of iron. Um, along the perimeter wall of Glasgow Cathedral lie a number of caged lairs, which would have been privately owned. You can actually see them as you look down the churchyard. You can see them just dotted in the distance. And the cathedral was heavily targeted by resurrection men. And along with the cage lairs, the cathedral also kept a watch, which would have fired pistols at midnight to indicate that the watch were on duty. There's also a mort safe in the cathedral, but the body snatching prevention dominating here is the caged lair. Now, I did recently discover that um, you can, if you go on Google Maps, it's excellent for wandering around Glasgow Cathedral itself, and you can actually walk into these uh, caged lairs and take a look around. So if you can't make it or we're in lockdown restrictions, just nip onto Google Maps uh, and have a look inside the caged lairs this Halloween. Once you've taken a stroll around the cathedral, I urge you then to take a trip to Ramshorn Kirkyard, located on Ingram Street, the site of perhaps one of Glasgow's most notorious body snatching cases. It's from this site that a Mrs. Janet McAllister, wife of well-known wool merchant in the city, was taken from her grave on the night of the 13th of December, 1813. When the theft was discovered the next morning, a mob quickly formed and through sheer bad luck of miscommunication, descended on the anatomy rooms of Dr. Granville Sharp Patterson in College Street. A search of the premises led to authorities finding a multitude of body parts, not all of which belonged to Janet. It was her dentist, however, who provided a positive identification, claiming that the teeth that were found on the premises still attached, attached to the jawbone were some of those that he'd actually fitted himself. At the trial in Edinburgh in 1814, doubts were raised over, to the, over the identification of the cadaver found in the dissecting rooms. Certain aspects just didn't add up, one being that Mrs. McAllister was a mother of eight and the body that had been reinterred was that of a virgin. Two bodies had also been stolen from the cathedral that same night as Mrs. McAllister had been snatched, casting further doubt as to the authenticity of the body. Now, it is this doubt that was to save, be the saving grace for the lecturers and the students involved when sentencing was passed the Lord Justice acquitted all parties, instead issuing a very stern warning and advice on conducting themselves better in the future. 
Now, there are some sites that you can go to where you can see a number of different prevention uh, types all at the same time. Doesn't necessarily mean that the site was heavily targeted, although as we see for uh, St Cuthbert's in Edinburgh, the, had the use of the high wall um, was of little effect, so they introduced the, the watchtower as a second form of prevention. But it is perhaps um, more of an individual preference that plays out here, or you may find that someone has gifted a mort safe or a mort stone, uh, for example, upon the death, um, and they've given it out to the parish. Perhaps the most famous site that you'll come across um, for multiple examples of body snatching prevention is Greyfriars. And as you step through the main gates to Greyfriars itself, you'll find the watch house on the right hand side. It was built in the 1830s and it's now the wee bookshop for the City of the Dead Tours. Now this uh, makes three types of body snatching prevention in Greyfriars alone. The cage layers that we saw earlier, uh, the watch house which is here and the extremely famous double mort safes, which are the highlight of any visit to Greyfriars. Now, a trip to Greyfriars would be nothing without mentioning these two, and a body snatching talk would be nothing without mentioning these two. Famous um, in their own right, these are the double mort safes of Greyfriars. The one on the left, which is essentially an iron cage, is uh, still in its original state, and it bears the date of 1829. The other, which is an iron frame over a small stone wall, is the burial plot of Major M. E. Lindsay for his, his two daughters and was restored in 2010 by the Greyfriars Kirkyard Trust. Now, just on the left as you go in through the main gates. Now here we have Lennel, um, uh, also known as Coldstream in the Scottish borders. And this site for me is particularly dear to my heart as it's the first place that I saw a mort safe still in situ in the ground. It's been a few years now since I went um, and it was extremely rusty then. I'll just get a pointer so you can perhaps make out. This is it here in a, in a just a, a rough coffin shape. And we can see similarity to the mort stone that we saw at Prestwick earlier with the bar across there. But the damage to the, to the corners and the rust, I don't expect much of it to be left um, to be honest with you. We're, we're talking quite a few years since I was up there now, which is a shame. But the site also um, hosts the ruins of a mort house, similar in style to a watch house, um, but coffins would have been placed in here and guarded until they were of no use for dissection. The idea behind them that you could watch numerous coffins at any one time, increasing efficiency and reducing the cost to the parish. Um, now, at Lennel, as an extra preventative measure, there was also an armed watch that patrolled the site. Now, whether they were extremely um, heavily targeted by Resurrection Month, I do not know, um, or there was a particularly jittery parish, but they were certainly fortified against uh, any visitations, let's say. Now, other sites with multiple relics, perhaps not as photogenic, um, include Bankery Devonick, which we saw earlier in relation to the, the sheaf styled um, mort safe. Um, and this one also has a watchtower. So we have the first on the extreme left there, that's the iron coffin. And, and then further on along the wall behind, behind it kind of thing is the watch house. Now we also have the twin sentry boxes of Fenwick in Ayrshire in the middle and one stands each um, end of the of the churchyard so both entry points into the churchyard and there's also a dilapidated cage there in the corner of the site it's missing its roof among other things but it is there you'll also find some punishment jugs on the wall of the church so it's quite a quite an interesting site at Fenwick there also at Fort Eviat in Perth and King Rock, so I apologise for my um, pronunciation of that, I think I've got it right. Um, there is a watch house now in this familiar style that we've seen, and there's also a mort stone. I will point this one out because it literally does look just like a lump of rock. There you have it there. Uh, you would have tripped over that and missed it. I can probably guarantee uh, I probably did a few, few trips around. Now, these sites are still worth a visit, and you know, I've got to be honest, which churchyard isn't? Um, so and if you're short on time, I would recommend going to one of these because you'll see a few different examples all at any one time. Now, if you want to see some real showstoppers, however, from the body snatching prevention world, then we need to head to the final uh, and next locations um, on our tour. With my mouse, there we go. 
I want to share with you now some real gems um, that have to be on your list if you find yourself body snatching, maybe not this Halloween, but maybe next Halloween or next time that you're in, to, in Scotland. Now, after a few fine adjustments to the design, Udney here uh, has a revolving mort house and it was completed just in time for the Anatomy Act to have passed in 1832. The site is completely unique owing to the revolving wooden turntable located inside the mort house itself. The idea was for coffins to be placed on the turntable, as and when available, obviously, and then that by the time the coffin was back in its original position, the body inside would no longer be of interest to the surgeons. An excellent idea, but one which kept the parishioners of Udney on their toes in regards to subscription rates and fees. 10 shillings entrance fee, fee plus one shilling every time a coffin was deposited, and many of the parishes, uh, uh, members of the parish were late in paying and subsequently fined. Now the Mort House failed to be a success as the Anatomy Act had already come into force before it's completed and by 1836 the key holders for the Mort House could no longer summon up the enthusiasm to follow the regulations. The Mort House however did have a second life for it was used by the Home Guard during World War II as a rifle store. If you do go up to Udney, there is an excellent information board that you can just see there um, on the left of the, of the watch house. Um, and it shows you how the, the inner workings of the turntable would have used. And it uh, shows you all architectural drawings on there. It's installed by the Udney Historical Group and it's an excellent, excellent resource for that, uh, that bit of body snatching relic there. Another of my absolute favourites, this is Old Pentland in Midlothian, and this has the honour of being the location for the first true body, body, first true recorded case of body snatching, sorry. In April 1742, the body of Gaston Johnson, young son of Robert Johnson, was taken from his grave and later found tucked under the arm of gardener John Samuel as he was walking through the city gates. Now, having been found guilty of being in possession of a dead child, Samuels was sentenced to be whipped throughout the streets of Edinburgh for his crime and was also banished from Scotland for seven years. We don't know where he went. He could have just nipped over the border into England. Now this site has a small watch house, which you can see here, which is just on the left as you enter the churchyard. Typical um, of the period. You can just see the chimney peeking out from under the trees there. Now this, these uh, mort safes here at Logerate are becoming just as, as famous as the ones in um, Greyfriars. And as you walk down the main steps of the parish church, you're almost immediately confronted with this trio of mort safes comprising uh, two adults and one for a child. It can be quite moving for someone to see it for the first time. These would have probably been private commissions and very obviously for a family group. They're surrounded by a small stone enclosure right next to the parish church. Now on the site in Logerate, there's also two mort stones. There's one leaning against the enclosure itself and there's another in situ in the grass and you can just see its iron, lift, uh, iron lifting rings are just visible, although they have been, they have been cut off. There is a bit of a hunt as, you, as you're walking around. It's a nice site, um, actually Logerate. There's some very, very good um, gravestones there. I do, however, want to finish my talk off with perhaps the best body snatching prevention that I personally have ever seen in situ and one which I think will continue to amaze people however often that they visit the site. This site is Clooney in Aberdeenshire and it is here that you can see four of the most excellent examples of mort safe typical to Aberdeenshire. Um, just stunning, located at the top of a small mound next to the Fraser Mausoleum the mort, safe here, mort safes here are the next dominant feature of the site. I just put on the next slide as a single one there. You can see that in all its glory, the iron skirt of the mort safe here would have driven down one foot six inches into the ground. Uh, and underneath the granite is, um, is the little hooks that would have been used with the mort safe tackle and then would have moved it into place uh, that way. But you can see how thick the granite stone is at the top and then the iron bars um, embedded into, into the underside there, just stunning. When I was there, the rabbits, however, had been in uh, and each of them had been digging, uh, digging inside in, in the holes under the mort safes. They were quite tantalizingly deep, although I didn't have the guts to put my hand in there. Um, I was in the middle of nowhere on my own. And uh, if I had been with someone, I might have had a look 
to see if I could tap to the top of the coffin, but uh, but I didn't. Just just beautiful. If, I do recommend if you go to one place on a body snatching tour, this is this is where you need to go. So I hope you have enjoyed your whirlwind tour of body snatching sites. I've tried to include a little bit of variation for you so that you can see uh, these relics if you do visit the area. The sites that we've looked at only just touch the surface of what you can see if you're interested in the subject of body snatching. For example, if you're in Edinburgh, I urge you to go and see the Coffin Collar in the National Museums of Scotland, as well as the Iron Coffin, and they're practically located side by side to each other. And there are also other sites where we only have anecdotes remaining that still warrant a visit, but I've left them out on this occasion. Now, while unfortunately we haven't had time to discuss many things associated with the macabre and wonderful world of body snatching, I have written about these, um, these sites and many more, as well as giving a comprehensive history on the subject of body snatching in my book, if you are interested in exploring the topic further. George. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, You're um, welcome. There's been so many wonderful <laughs> out there. And thank you so much for those amazing photographs. They're, they're just brilliant. I think a lot of us are looking at those comments. People just hadn't really <laughs> how much um, archaeology there is still out there and how much evidence for yes. there is to still go and explore. So thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> so, we're about to go into question time. So okay. An opportunity to put to Susie any questions you have. Um, but before we go into that um, time, if you've enjoyed this lecture, please do, as we said at the start of this lecture, please do consider supporting our work in helping um, protect and care for historic churches across England. Um, as I said, there is a special membership offer running at the moment. So if you join us by direct debit from as little as three pounds a month, um, we are sending you in return a free copy of Matthew Burns' Beautiful Churches book. Um, there's details of that offer on our main Facebook page, as well as in the link to this live stream. But also, if you have a mobile phone with you, um, you can text CCT to 70331, and that will give us a gift of three pounds. So as I said, if you enjoyed these lectures, please do um, consider making a donation. Now, Susie, there's been lots of questions coming on. <laughs> We're on over 30 questions. So really? <laughs> That's good and bad. <laughs> so I'm going to um, jump straight in. Um, I think this is really interesting because obviously we focus on Scotland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, would you classify Edinburgh as the body snatching capital of the world? No. <laughs> um, I think it's to me anyway. I think it's it's Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, the wider the wider uh, area there. I think Edinburgh has probably uh, going on its fame now, like the, the the double mort safes that we were looking at earlier. Everybody knows those and looks at those and then goes and looks at Tom Riddle's grave. And so Edinburgh is naturally the first place to go. But as you can see from today, there's just so much more out there that hasn't been looked at. And to me, it's Aberdeen. Aberdeenshire all the time. I mean, look at Clooney. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much for that answer there. Um, and another question that's come in here. Um, what was the legal position on exhuming bodies at the time? Okay, so there was no, a body didn't belong to anybody. So you technically were allowed to, to exhume it. What got you into trouble? Um, if, you were, if you were caught with the, the cadaver, it was classed as a misdemeanor. So a couple of six, six weeks imprisonment, maybe it's a small fine. But if um, you took anything from the grave itself, so anything like uh, the, the burial shroud, maybe some jewellery or anything, then it would have escalated to a felony. Um, and because you were stealing somebody's property at the time, the, the body didn't belong to anybody. So technically you weren't stealing anything. We do know of a case of a um, student that had removed the burial shroud during the snatching, but unbeknown to them, the, the lace cuff had come off and was still around the um, the cadaver's wrist. So they they got caught to that, and not and not the body snatching. They were in more trouble for that than the body snatching. Obviously frowned upon because you know it's not something not very nice to have the the grave emptied, but it wasn't wasn't illegal as such. So. Thank you. And I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Okay. Similar themes, but um, were the watchmen employed by parishes or were they volunteers? And is there any evidence of collaboration between watchmen and body snatchers or any evidence of bribery at all? Oh, massive evidence of bribery. <laughs> That's what I love about it, all the corruption. Um, so the, the first the first one, there could have been both employed by the, watch, by the parish and um, put in place 
um, by the parishioners themselves. Um, you do have accounts where friends would have taken it in turn. So you're kind of like on a rotor system uh, and, and, and looking after, probably watching over the grave of your friend. If there was not nobody specific in place for, for the watch itself, there is a case, and I, and I can't remember the place, I'm sorry off the top of my head, where two body snatchers were actually employed as the watchmen um i think it's down it's down south somewhere i'm sorry i forget but that that's quite an interesting little case but bribery absolutely um body snatchers would have would have uh you know dished off a, a couple of pence a couple of shillings and said let us know when when a body's ready or maybe it's when they're back filling the grave they would have put it into a sack and then raised the sack up at the same time that they're, they're back filling so that when the body snatchers got there they didn't have to do much digging they could just take it out from from the you know, a few inches of soil. You also get accounts where um, the the um, grave digger has maybe put the, the body into into the little hut at the side, and then the body snatcher just comes around and, and collects it from there. So lots of collaboration, <laughs> lots. Yeah, and I, that's, it, a, that's a lecture all of it itself, that George. <laughs> um, We've talked obviously a lot about surgeons and the, the supply going to um, a lot of medical um, or anatomy schools um, in Scotland. Um, did body snatchers only sell their, you know, cadavers to medical professions or were there other um, people who are interested in cadavers as well? Yeah, yeah, mainly mainly to medical professions. So you, you'll get it to the, to the teaching hospitals and teaching schools. You also would have got it to um the, the the country the what doctor who wanted to keep his hand in with um with his techniques etc there's artist models that you can hear of um they would have um also sold their body bits as well so you'd sell the full cadaver to people but teeth were also sold separately um and extremities were also sold separately cases where people cut their heads off and, and dealt with just those so so yeah it wasn't just a quick um, I'll dig a body up and that will go straight to the doctors. There was a lot of interchanging interchanging going on. And so earlier on, uh, before we started the lecture, everyone, um, me and Susie were talking about a BBC um, uh, episode that was aired. And um, Susie actually is in that um, series. So do go on to BBC iPlayer and look yeah. at <laughs> Britain's Biggest Dig. Um, and obviously there was, I know, I think they're up in... Um, at the ball ring and they were doing some excavation there and as you just said you know about body parts they were finding arms that had been amp the hands are amputated you know feet are amputated so that kind of it, it all plays into that's evidence of you know people going in and actually doing the amputations there once they're even buried yeah i mean i'm i'm not a medical historian so that kind of goes goes past my my remit I'm, I'm afraid but everything that there was there was showing on the the britain's biggest dig where, where they were finding um I think they found bricks in grave and every in, in graves. We can see that with body snatching. So they would have substituted the weight. They're trying to get the weight um, in the coffin to, to replicate that of a body. Um, and so they would have put bricks in it. So we can see body snatching coming through in that way. But as far as the amputations and the, the medical bits, that's not that's not my area, I'm afraid. <laughs> I wouldn't like to delve into that. There are some fantastic. Um, medical historians out there. So uh, you've got Lindsay Fitzharris, Surgeon's Apprentice. She's a great one to have a look at. I'm sure her website will uh, will explain everything. <laughs> Thanks, Susie. And I'm going to ask a couple more questions again. Mm. Um, was there really? Uh, we've talked about obviously, you, especially with the revolving and watch house, where you know they were trying to delay the amount of time a cadaver was kept before a body snatch could um, get it. So it was, you know. Um, it was no longer of use mm. to the medical professions. What was kind of the best before date, um, really? For, <laughs> and I'm quoting someone did genuinely say. So did I, they? That's awesome. That you did. <laughs> so, so bodies were usually snatched either the same night or a couple of days um, after. It's usually within a day or probably a day that night or the next day. Um, any more safes or uh, other body snatching prevention that we are used usually stays in about six weeks and that's a firm guarantee then that nothing's going to be taken. I do know of a case in Peterborough where um, they dug up the wrong the wrong corpse and um, I think they didn't go quite in the far along the row uh, and they ended up you just have to cut extremities off then so you could dig it up and you've done all that work and you think, oh, 
no, I can have is the arm, so I'll chop that off and, and on it goes. I was just uh, writing about one the other day where the body snatchers had dug, had dug a cadaver up and it was too, too rotten, so they did just leave it on the grass in the churchyard, unfortunately, for the parishioners to find the next day. It wasn't worth their effort to, to put it back. So, but usually six, six weeks, I'd say that's, that's what's usually banded around. But Thank you. Well, that's uh, really useful information to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it, are there any cases of mort safes being reused? Because I imagine they were obviously incredibly expensive and it was something that, you know, only the wealthy could really afford. Did anyone ever try to reuse them? Uh, yes, yeah, so you have the parish, the parish mort safes, the ones that we saw um, at East, uh, at Bolton in East Lothian and in Air, that one. There's a, um, gosh, you'll find them Lithgow, um, the ones in um, Alloway Oldkirk. So anything that's in not in situ but is in the parish church still they would have been the church's own own use ones and they would have been hired out and reused and reused at some point someone has to be the last occupant don't forget so although it could still be in situ it could be the last it could be the parish's last use of that mort safe and they just haven't taken it out well you know what's what's the point where else are you going to put it um so but there was a subscription subscription um, fee and a lot, a lot of parishes um, had their, had a more safe society. So you would have paid to enter it and then you would have, you know, benefited of, of use from the more safe itself. And if you were poor, Susie, what kind of preventative measures? I would love you... poor ones. <laughs> I love poor ones. Bless them, bless them. They used to put little like um, stacks of stones or a little pile of sticks on top of the grave, um, so that and and put it in a certain way so that they could come back the next day and see if that it had been moved, and they were satisfied that it hadn't. It had a negative affect that not only um did it shout to the body snatchers hey here we go look we've got a little little beacon on top of the grave here to show that the uh, the body's just been buried but they would just take a sketch or make a note of of how the the stones or the sticks would have been placed and then take the body out and put them back on straight away the same day the same way so that was a bit ineffective they also did um straw or stones mixed in with the soil this was to try and slow the body snatchers down as they were digging and put them off, really. Um, whether it worked or not, probably in cahoots with the, with the sexton anyway. So you do that, put the, put the straw in and raise the body at the same time. So yeah, poor, bless them. They were heavily targeted, poor, so. And um, going into kind of the people, you know, who were the body snatchers? And is there any evidence of women being involved in body snatching? So body snatches could be could be anybody. We've got accounts where there are solicitors' clerks in in Leeds, the um, the uh, anatomy students themselves in the beginning, and the surgeons themselves in the beginning. We also have um, people that would have been um, general criminals that throughout the year turned to body snatching, maybe uh, in the winter, uh, sextons and grave diggers that. Were corrupt at first and maybe has got a bit greedy then had to turn uh, and become body snatchers themselves so they were it has been said they're for the lowest of the low yes i uh, kind of agree but i uh, i think they also had a bit of wit about them as far as women go they were usually um used as um accomplices so they would have gone um as scouting agents pretended to to be the the long lost niece of somebody that had died in the parish and they've only just just arrived and have heard of the demise um and to try and get information out of the sexton or the grave digger as to how deep is the grave going to be buried you know what time's the funeral um and so this information was then relayed back to the body snatchers who could then go and uh, steal the body later on. They also used to use the women to go to the workhouses and claim the, the unclaimed dead uh, and say that this is a similar story. I've just come into to the parish and discovered my uncle has, has died. I am here. Give him to me and I'll take him and I'll bury him. Uh, and the parish would, would have given, the, given over the body that way. So women were, were used quite a lot, actually. And I think we've got time for maybe one more question. I'm going to combine a couple because you kind okay. of touched on it just a little bit there. But um, you've talked in your last slide, um, you showed us about um, 
I think you said that the last group of four of the mort safes, they extended um, 18 inches into the ground. How deep was it for, you know, back in those days for, you know, what's the average depth they would bury a coffin at? Okay, again, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I, I will hold my hand up to that. Um, we get them at different varying levels, like Joseph Hall, who we talked about earlier, who was found in High Bradfield. That grave there was only four feet deep. Uh, mainly because there was a stone jutting out where they wanted to put him. That dictated how deep it was going. Um, and then you hear um, in, in London, et cetera, where they're, they're running out of space, so there's not enough space to dig them down. Whether or not that happened in, in Scotland, I'm not 100% sure, so I can't really answer that. But um, this six feet under, I'm, I'm not sure where that comes from. I, I'm, yeah, I'm body snatching, I'm afraid. I'm taking, I'm taking them the other way. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to play, squeeze in just one quick. Okay, go for it. <laughs> um, obviously, in London, there were um, big cemeteries were sort of came into action after legislation was passed um, for, for the the Anatomy Act was passed, but there was still wasn't there still a, almost a fear of having your body snatched. And how long did that kind of last on after the act was unpassed? Quite a long time, from from what I, I could understand. I mean. Um, there's an account, I think it's 1869, of a gentleman in London who was caught at St Pancras watching over the grave of his niece because uh, he was convinced that she was going to be snatched. Uh, when he was arrested, he had on him a, a gun and a chopper, which I presume is an axe. So that fear was still there. And you do read accounts in like local histories or just in like snippets in newspapers where the parish are still, somebody in the parish can still remember it happening, you know, like their grandparents or thing. And so it's still not folklore, but it's still on the, on the lips of people. And so it quite, a, quite late on, I would say probably as a, for want of a, a date for the 1880s, but don't quote me on that, but it's still rumbled, rumbled along. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Susie, for all your answer. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for your um, questions there. Do keep them coming. Please keep commenting away as um, we'll um, forward on those questions. Um, Feel to free to, to tweet more. me any questions if you want and try and answer them. <laughs> um, so everyone, um, please, if you've enjoyed this, um, do sign up for next week's lecture. So next week, um, we're going to be looking at um, making headway with a headstone, how to look beneath and beyond. Um, and that's been um, done by Sheldon K. Goodman, who's the curator of the Cemetery Cup club um which is a great um do go onto twitter and look at cemetery club because it's a brilliant twitter feed um and so we're going to be looking at basically how do you read a gravestone so if you go um for a country walk um or if you go into a churchyard and look at headstones what are the symbols you want to be looking at um which will tell you about that person um who was buried there so do sign up um for that lecture you can find details on our website which is visitchurches.org.uk or if you just go into our events page on our facebook page you can find and more information there. But Susie, thank you so much um, for joining us again. And thank you everyone for joining us. As I said, please do consider making a donation if you've enjoyed this lecture. You can donate um, three pounds by texting CCT to 70331, or you can join us as a member um, and get a free copy of Matthew Burns' um, Beautiful Churches book if you join us by direct debit. Um, there's details of that in our um, on our feed there. But if you've got any questions, um, any suggestions for future lectures, do send us a message. Um, also do check out our previous recordings. You can watch them on YouTube or on Facebook completely free of charge. But once again, thanks everyone for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you next week for another Thursday lunchtime lecture.